you know, at times I think of Essen as this cosmic peyote button. I mean, it's just this huge amount of altered state. It's no accident that one of the core elements of Esalen is an attempt to radically reframe what we mean by psychosis and to see it not as a pure pathology to be avoided at all costs, but rather a phase in a creative transformation. As a freshman at Stanford, I was a kind of a campus hot dog and some of my fraternity brothers wanted me to run for student body president. I was in the class of Frederick Spiegelberg, a great professor of comparative religious studies who'd been on a trip to India, and the word was around he was bringing back great wisdom from the East. He came into the classroom and he said, Brahman, 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 the omnipresent reality, and Atman is Brahman our access to it through our deepest subjectivity, Atman. The power of it, the intuitive rightness of it, hit me with incredible force. And as I was walking back, a sense kept going through my mind, I'm never going to be the same. I'm never going to be the same. Well, that turned out to be the case. I was flooded with conviction that this is what I wanted to embody for the rest of my life. I said, I'm just going to go ahead to the Arbindu Ashram, come hell or high water. For, for me to just drop out was disconcerting and even alarming to some of them. And some of them kind of wondered, you know, about my mental balance. This was a, a glorious retreat. And that enabled me to really anchor my meditation practice and my intellectual pursuits forevermore, without any more thoughts ever again of a conventional vocation. I came back from India in 1957 and uh, soon conceived the idea to start a center in Big Sur on this old family property. Meanwhile, I met an old classmate, Dick Price, who had had a psychotic break, triggered by kind of ecstatic inspirations not unlike mine. And because of that, ended up in the Institute for the Living. And to make a long story short, Dick had 67 insulin shock treatments over a year and a half, 67. He had uh, really suffered at the hands of the psychiatric reductionism that later Abe Maslow and Carl Rogers and Rollo May and others were in revolt against. The fact that we have such an enormous percentage of the population of this country in mental institutions is a thing that we may have to look at from a very different point of view. Not that there may be a high incidence of mental sickness, but that there may be a high incidence of intolerance of variations of consciousness. Part of the dance with the deconstruction of the personality is a dance with madness, with psychosis. He came into Esalen really in his heart to aid a opening up of psychiatry and medical practice to another view of psychosis, that some of it at least is a breakthrough that certain people have, their way into a greater consciousness. I'm David Price, son of Dick Price. I think that he wanted to reform psychology in America. He wanted a, a place for people to be supported uh, that was going through what he would consider would call a transitory psychotic break without drugs without uh, chemical management and without without being locked uh, locked up and without uh, being treated as someone to be afraid of I 
and I think that's one of the things that made him very effective as a facilitator, was that he had been on the other side, so he really wasn't afraid. He held a larger space for somebody in suffering than anybody I have met since. And almost the deeper they were in suffering, the bigger he got. So there were a number of times in the Esalen community where somebody actually went into a psychotic episode. He set up 24-hour sitters for those people. And it was the idea that this break was actually the organism trying to heal itself. Our job when we came in to sit for our four-hour shift was to just be present with the person. No analysis, just to be present, protect them from any physical harm. And the idea with that was that, you know, we're not stopping the process. What if we make this assumption, as other cultures did, that maybe this is some type of spiritual emergence? This is the organism's way of actually coming to more wholeness. living in a world where deviant opinions about religion are no longer dangerous. Today, serious heresy is a deviant state of consciousness. We're all Buddhas, but we're potential Buddhas in that we might wake up to the fact that we are one with the consciousness that is the consciousness of all. That adventure has come to everybody and not everybody's up to it. Julian Silverman, who was a rising star in the field of uh, research psychology, was at NIH, created a clinic up at Agnew State Hospital that was co-sponsored by NIH, the California Department of Mental Hygiene, and Esalen. When Gabriel Roth first came to Esalen, there was a lot of use of psychedelics as a medium or a portal to enter into ecstatic states. And she herself used to tell funny stories about smoking cigarettes, taking acid, whatever she could, you know, get her hands on. And she would say, you know, I would just, I, I tried all these different things and none of them got me as high as when I would actually dance. So she decided to put the cigarettes down, put the intoxicants down, and just use the body as this incredible vehicle to enter into ecstatic states. As we move and we breathe, she could see that something was happening. So she looked and studied more and more in depth until she discovered what she called the sacred trinity conscious union between breath, movement, and spirit. And that when a person focuses with their breath, with their movement, and with their spirit, they come very quickly out of the chattering mind, the criticizing mind that is usually resting in the past or in the future, and redirects or transforms the quality of mind into a state of embodied presence where past dissolves, future dissolves, and the quality of the chattering mind is transformed into what she called embodied presence. In the 70s, you've got Stan Groff living here. He, you know, he starts out in, in, in Czechoslovakia as a classical Freudian psychoanalyst. He was one of the young medical students to whom they gave LSD to try to imitate a psychosis. And the way he, his Dan tells the story, instead of a psychosis, he sees God, basically, and it just flips his world. 
he becomes fascinated in LSD research and Mike invites him out here and he ends up staying for 14 years. He's interested in, of course, LSD and psychedelics, but they're now illegal. And so he has to develop some other way of getting people into altered states, and he develops this holotropic breath work. Initially, people were not very happy when I was talking about the research that we have done. And they said, well, it's all it's great to hear about these fantastic experiences, but can't we do something? Do you have a little stash on the side, you know? I said, I don't have the license here for that, and I don't think Esalen would be very happy. And so I started thinking about, you know, what could we do experientially? So I saw that faster breathing could somehow bring material out of the unconscious to consciousness. And so we started playing with it. It wasn't even called holotropic breathwork at that point in time. You know, we just laid down on mats and he played this music and we started breathing and talked about our experiences <laughs> afterwards. I just thought, yeah, well, you know, this is interesting stuff. The holotropic breathwork, it's, it's important because it's not a substance. And so people really realize that their innate wisdom, this truest source of wisdom is coming from within them and they have this opportunity to reorient to themselves as a source of healing. I have people say to me all the time, the most psychedelic experience I ever had was a holotropic breathwork session. Obviously, doing any kind of non-ordinary state work, you want to be in nature because your senses are heightened, your awareness, your attune, the veil is thin. But honestly, I think just being at Esalen, being held by the land there is just unparalleled in my experience. Just as important as the journey is itself is as the time that you take to land from the experience and weave it into your own existence so that it becomes a part of you. It's not the stories you tell, it's who you become because of where you've traveled and the actual presence that you rest in. We are entering into these sacred circles in a thousand different offerings and programming that's offered here. And each one of those circles, in a way and in essence, is allowing and inviting a person to come in to hold that which is too big to be held alone. If people are going to experience a transformation, they need to have a container. They need to feel safe. And there's a container at Esalen. There's a community to fall back on when things get too crazy or too bad or too wonderful because they know they're not really letting themselves go completely. There's somebody there to catch them.